how'd you guys meet as a little 11 year olds did you guys run into each other in like the street <laughs> like how did y'all connect yeah so um we brian and i have known each other since we were 11 years old and we were just sitting at the same lunch table in, in the middle of bettendorf iowa and through casual conversation, just discovered we were both using our action figures to make stop motion videos. And uh, from there, like we just decided, let's combine our action figure collection and start making movies together. So. As far as when you guys get up to uh, UI, like when did you, did you guys know you were gonna go up there and make films? Like, was that always in the initial idea? Um, yeah, kind of, because basically in middle school and high school, Scott and I were making these really ambitious, like micro-budget feature films um, as kids and, you know, heavily influenced by our heroes like Paul Thomas Anderson and Martin Scorsese. And when we started looking at schools, we looked into various film schools and we just kept thinking, we're doing so much film outside of class that it might be weird to go to school and then also be inundated with film classes. So we decided to stay local and, and go to the University of Iowa and major in communications and try to get like a more well-rounded education while making movies and basically skipping class to go make movies on, on the side. Um, did you guys, as far as when the MTV thing came about, mm -hmm. did you guys send that in? Like, how did you guys decide, okay, we've got something, let's send it right. in there. Like, tell me about that process. Yeah. So um, the process, it was a competition called MTV Best Film on Campus, and we had already shot this, this feature film called University Heights that we shot in Iowa City for like $300 using local cast and crew, and we submitted essentially the trailer for um, that film into the competition just to like warm the doors up, and through the competition we ended up winning that, and it was this development deal with MTV Films, and as two like 20-year-olds in the middle of Iowa, we we're like, oh, we got a development deal, like, we've made it, <laughs> but... Little did we know like how long the ladder actually is to finally like work your way into Hollywood. And um, that process was very long and arduous and gave us a great taste for what it really takes to make it um, in the film industry. And uh, we ended up navigating over the course of a couple years, um, navigating ourselves to um, this guy who we consider a mentor, David Gale, who used to head up MTV Films. He fostered the careers of like Mike Judge, Alexander Payne, Craig Brewer, these filmmakers that we loved watching their movies growing up. And we were like, we wanna be aligned with this guy. And um, he took us in and was like, look guys, if you have an idea for a TV show or some sort of movie, I'm all ears. And we pitched him this, this um, dark David Fincher-esque show called Spread that he gave us a little bit of money. We took that back to University of Iowa and shot uh, a pilot presentation that then continued to open doors for us. So um, we're super grateful for that opportunity and really thankful to David Gale for you know helping out two Iowa guys. It's funny. I when I watched It Follows, yeah. I thought of Spread. I was yeah. like, it's oh, the cool. same <laughs> damn concept, basically. Yeah. Like, sex is bad, you yeah. little kids. Yes. Um, yeah, that's cool. How cool is it then to jump from that to, I mean, you guys have kept, not, not necessarily in that genre, but mm -hmm. like in that mold of shocking kind of fun horror. It's not really yeah. spooky, spooky, but yeah. it's intelligent to some extent oh, about what you. you guys are yeah. looking at. Um, how did the Project Greenlight impact your writing or right. put you guys on another stage? Like, how did that affect you guys? Yeah. Well, I, like, Project Greenlight um, happened almost concurrently with, like, the MTV Films competition. And um, in Project Greenlight, like, it, it was one of those opportunities that we felt, oh, we actually have a chance of um, hopefully, like, breaking through if we just stick around long enough. And so we, um, Project Greenlight was a competition where we just kept kind of moving up the ranks. And unfortunately, like, we topped out, like, towards the, the finalists. But again, it was a situation where it gave a little more exposure and just honestly a a little more passion and um, momentum for us to build upon and um, for the longest times we were writing like these giant scripts that would cost 150 million dollars and those competitions told us let's write something that we could do for you know a little bit of money and we could direct ourselves or write ourselves in Iowa or in California and so it just kind of focused where our energy should really be placed so with that in mind, it seems like y'all's writing all the way up to a Quiet Place has gotten mm -hmm. more insular as far as even the number of people in it. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's been conscious. 
from your part? Yeah, yeah we, yeah, it's um, a big part of our process is always, we, we call it like writing scalable movies because it's very hard to get a movie made. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a huge investment of money and time and resources by many, many other people, uh, people involved. So we, we try to make it as attractive as possible. So A Quiet Place and, and many of the other films we've, we've written um, was this idea that if nobody else wanted to make it, if no studio wanted to come on board and do the big expensive um, Emily Blunt version of the film, we could make it in Iowa for half a million dollars. Just very contained. Um, we love big ideas that have a lot of um, scope, but um, are, are kind of, at the end of the day, intimate character studies. Those are just the things that we gravitate towards. And, and I think part of that is growing up with classic cinema, growing up with um, you know Hitchcock movies and and um, the limitations of the time period of those older films uh, necessitated that they were big ideas that could be achieved on a, on a smaller scale in terms of production. And so, I don't know, those are just the movies we love and, and, and love to write. So then when you're, you've got the script and you, with that mindset, Paramount comes aboard, yeah. Krasinski, like, yeah. what is that step when you meet with John and he wants yeah. to direct it? Yeah. yeah, what was it, that like? It was um, it was such a, a mind blowing kind of it was very surreal experience when um, John and Emily came aboard, especially because um, it, it's not that we uh, didn't have the kind of ambition to do kind of the A list um, big version of a quiet place, but the studio was going to make it without movie stars. And, and that's one of the, the cool things about the horror genre is that the genre itself is the star. So you don't necessarily need those A-listers. And, and A Quiet Place had a big idea. Um, and so when we were first meeting with our producers, Platinum Dunes, about, you know, they were asking us, like, who do you guys imagine in, in, in these roles? Um, and, you know, for us, it was like, we were, we were just kind of like, oh, you know, it'd be so cool to get someone like Emily Blunt. We'll never get her. Like, that's outrageous. Like, we're not, you know, sorry for even mentioning that. But, like, somebody like that. Um, so when John and Emily came together and, and John had the passion to kind of like want to, to bring it to life, it was so exciting for us. And we had been a fan um, of John. His, he did two independent films that, um, that um, not a lot of people saw, but um, there was a lot of, um, you know, there was a lot of interesting stuff in those films and it showed a lot of promise. So it was exciting for us. Like during his breaks from um, the office. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> As far as the daughter's character mm -hmm. and the importance of sound to her character alone, mm -hmm. where did that come from? Because that was that was fascinating. Um, that was one of those ideas that just kind of came out over the process of writing the project. I don't mean writing just in terms of the script itself, but over 10 years we were culminating ideas for this. and. First came the idea of what we would consider the gimmick, you know, about these monsters, they'll kill you if you make a sound. Um, and then we had to anchor that gimmick in something more than just, you know, a log line. And for us, the best horror movies that we think about, whether it's Jaws or Aliens, um, they're anchored in so many character dynamics. And what was really important to us was find a family that was going through a conflict, whether or not this apocalyptic event happened. And we figured there's going to be an issue of communication here, there's going to be some sort of a loss that the family suffered. And then simultaneously, when we were coming up with those ideas, we started thinking, um, writing a character that was deaf. And it wasn't necessarily like, Eureka, that's a great idea. It was more that it just felt natural to us and felt like something that um, could anchor a character in a different dynamic than what we've seen in any movie, but also explore kind of what this family's going through. And through the course of writing, like, it's that discovery of, oh, like this, this character who's deaf, like she has the ultimate strength and she essentially is the one to have the epiphany of what ultimately saves the day for us. So it was a very, very natural kind of writing um, circumstance that came to that conclusion. So. Did you guys always have it where there would be this moment of the daughter's understanding that she is loved specifically by her father, like that yeah. father daughter connection. Yeah. That was really the, the story point that we figured out really early on and everything was on rails to that point. Um, it was, it wasn't enough to just scare an audience. Like we, we wanted to make sure if, if everyone did their job right, that it would be emotionally impactful by the end. Um, again, like one of our favorite filmmakers is M night Shyamalan and you watch the signs or unbreak signs, unbreakable or six Sense. like all of 
those have very, very rich characters that are living in essentially like a B movie. And what makes it come alive so much is the fact that you do care about these characters and that they ultimately have to have some discovery that they've been kind of hiding from themselves. So we very much were, were taking, you know, a page from his, his uh, playbook. What's it like being two guys that write a movie where it's the uh, strong women that survive yes. this massacre? <laughs> We've... Um it's a uh, it's a beautiful place to be, and it's something that we've been um, accused of doing ever since we were young. Like, yeah. <laughs> love writing female characters, and I don't know, that's very cool. What um, what was Emily's reaction to reading the script? Because I think, mm-hmm. I mean, the bathtub scene alone is like crazy and amazing. Right. <laughs> but I think her reactions with the kids throughout, mm-hmm. she has a different quality than John does, who is mm-hmm. all survival. Um, how did she react to the way you guys wrote? Yeah. Um, I, I, she reacted in the best way imaginable, which is I'm we're making this movie and Paramount, you know, instantly greenlights it. It was the biggest blessing in the world. Emily for us is the greatest working actor today. Like that's just how we feel. Like we've loved her and everything that she's ever done. And and our hope with writing the script was that it would be a fun movie to perform in as an actor because it's all about um, nonverbal cues. It's all about what you don't say, which creates just a completely different challenge um, from an acting standpoint. And um, needless to say, those guys knocked it out of the park. One of my favorite scenes in the film is the way to communicate, oh shit, something's wrong, yeah. is the lights. Yes. Yeah. Um, was that always in the script? Where yeah. did you guys come yeah. up with that? That was beautiful. Thank was you cool. so much. We really appreciate that. Yeah, that was that was always something in the script. It was always uh, part of the fun of writing the script was really just brainstorming how do you how do you communicate anything to an audience without the crutch of dialogue? How do you communicate that something is bad is gonna happen? How do these care, how does this family um, communicate with each other? Um, and so that came pretty early on. It's like, well, red lights, red floodlights, and um, you know that's an easy way to signal without um, having to say anything. Um, and we love uh, the way uh, John and, and, and his production designer, like we love the way that they design the lights. It's, it's very, it's something very cinematic, um, which is, you know, stuff we, we attempt to put on the page, but it, you know, they, they executed at a high level, really elevated it. You guys mentioned Hitchcock. I think Brian, you said that, yeah. um, Hitchcock loved sound. He loved yeah. the, the loss of sound too. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's kind of creepy. You guys are the closest I think we've seen to someone having the guts to make a film all about that quality. Do you guys think about that in what you're writing now? Yeah. Like dealing with different types of, not just visual education in a film? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we've been adamant about sound design ever since we were in high school and doing the own sound design for our movies, like our um, our film that we wrote and directed, Haunt, um, which we're, we're, we just finished up post-production. Like we demanded to take that to Skywalker Sound because we knew we needed an all-star team to really bring home essentially what's more than half the storytelling for us. So a lot of the stuff we're writing right now, um, we're, we're writing a Stephen King adaptation of his short story, The Boogeyman, for, for Fox right now. And so a lot lot of the conversations that we already brought to the table was how do we enact sound in a very like visceral way that also communicates everything you need to know about the story and what the boogeyman is and then other projects down the line it's absolutely one of our first thoughts because um the movies that we really love to see are those Friday night movies where it's either horror or it's a comedy or something, but it's it's going to move the audience in a, in a communal way where you're hearing every single beat of the story through the way the audience is reacting. And um, horror movies are incredible at that, especially when it's about what you don't see. And, um, you know, Quiet Place was very much built upon that mantra. It's not about seeing the monster every single, you know, time it comes out. It's about suggesting it through sound design or misdirecting your attention so that when the really big scare comes, you're not expecting it. We're pulling the sound out entirely. And very much the script for A Quiet Place was a roadmap for that that then the rest of the production uh, team, you know, added to and, and built out in a brilliant way. So it's incredibly important, as important as pointing the camera in any certain direction. So. What's the best experience you guys have had watching this in a theater with an audience? Because I know when we watch there's a press screening mm-hmm. and there's a moment where you do take the entire sound out of it. Yeah. And every, I think there was a, I know in the group I was in, we were like, oh, don't, 
don't do anything. <laughs> like, did, how much fun is it to watch audience watch this film? Yeah, it's incredible. And the best experience we had was actually here in Austin earlier this year at South by Southwest. Um, in part because we, the movie had just been completed like 18 hours prior. So no one really, no one on the production side had a chance to see how the film was going to play. But, um, you know, watching it at the, at the Paramount with, I don't know, 1,200 people, I think it was, um, hearing the sound sucked out of the room as soon as the movie got quiet was beyond, you know, what anybody had really hoped. And it, it just was a fortuitous example of when movies actually work that an audience can have a very emotional or visceral reaction to it. Um, so that was hands down, I think, the, the best experience we've had so far. So. What does it mean to you to come back to Austin and specifically know that you're going to be talking about the writing yeah. and yeah. what you guys do well? Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a huge honor to be back in Austin. And, and I, I love this film festival so much in the sense that like it focuses on writers because writers are such a, a crucial part of the storytelling process, which seems like an obvious idea idea but it, it's it's an amazing to be a part of a festival that really features and highlights that huge honor and since you guys brought up lucas studios uh how much time did you guys get to spend out there like do you get to go back there again like how cool is yeah that? yeah no i mean it's beautiful yeah like skywalker ranch is the most it, it's it's heaven on earth especially for movie buffs and um yeah we're, we're always bugging them we're like we're gonna come back and do a writing retreat here and 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 our, and our you know our hope is to always bring every movie there because those guys are wizards yeah. and yeah, it, and it's incredible, too, because you just run into everybody that's worked on any great movie possible. Like, we were at the um, Skywalker store just buying a bunch of T-shirts while we had the chance, and uh, Ben Burt, you know, from Star Wars, just wanders in, and, and our uh, sound designer was like, oh, that's Ben Burt right there. And we're like, yeah, we know. <laughs> and you feel like you're you're meeting George Clooney or somebody. <laughs> so it's it's incredible to, to see legends at work there, and just the setting that they have is one of the most peaceful retreats you could hope for. When, um, when making a movie where every single step of the process is always noise and so many voices and cooks in the kitchen. It's, it's a peaceful retreat, yeah. As far as kind of y'all's writing together, mm -hmm. how do y'all do it? Do you, you know, who comes up with what first? Do you guys critique each other? Do you separate and come back? Like, how do y'all do it? Um, yeah, our process is very much getting on the same page first and foremost about the story that we want to tell and the very basic beats and where the movie might be going. And then like Brian will, will take a pass like the first 10 pages and he'll send it to me and I'll take a look at that, give feedback and then revise those 10 pages, maybe go to like 15 pages. And it continues that way. One thing that we try to keep very precious in our, our writing style is not always knowing where the story is going to go. And a, a perfect example of that in Quiet Place would be the nail scene where we were writing the script and just put a nail in the staircase and planted that, not knowing where are you going to pay that off, when in the story are you going to pay that off. And then finally, like, you start writing yourself further and further in the story, and it just organically presents an opportunity of, oh, that's where she's going to step on the nail. So we try to be very, very open in our writing process, not to lock ourselves um, in a certain direction or paint ourselves into a corner. And I guess to kind of wrap up, I'd love to know, what do you guys watch? What do you guys read? Like, what, mm -hmm. what keeps you guys entertained? Yeah. Everything. I mean, we're, um, you know, we, we've been working a lot in the horror genre, but we're students of, of all film. So, um, you know, we're just as excited about, you know, a Wes Anderson movie like Isle of Dogs as we are um, about Jordan Peele's Get Out. Um, you know, recently, this year, uh, one of my favorite movies was First Reformed uh, by Paul Schrader. Thought it was um, just a, 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 a unexpected masterpiece from a master. Um, yeah, we love, uh, so good, so good. And uh, we loved Eighth Grade, uh, mm -hmm. Bo Burnham's Eighth Grade, we thought was was a blast um, and, and very true to the experience of being an eighth grader, very relatable. Um, yeah, everything. And then reading, you know, we mostly are reading scripts in, in terms of like narrative fiction, but we're students of Hollywood, so we love reading like old Hollywood books, uh, yeah. like Easy Riders and Raging Bulls. And I'm reading a history of screenwriting right now. What are you reading? Um, well, we're uh, I think we're both revisiting Stephen King's on writing because yeah. oh, yeah. when you're doing a Stephen King adaptation, you want to <laughs> listen to the master and hopefully pick up a few cues. Um, and then watching like uh, I've been watching. I have I just had a daughter like a few months ago, so I watch TV much more often than I watch films. So like I've been catching up on Black Mirror and just absolutely adore how they take these terrifying ideas but root them in humanity and um 
Yeah, like Brian said, watch everything. Uh, Truffaut is who I always go back to to fill up the tank. Like I just watched this um, somewhat obscure Truffaut film called Small Change, where it's just this observational thing where you watch a bunch of kids run around and do stupid things like fall out of 11-story windows. <laughs> it's, it's not a documentary, let me clarify that. But it's just whatever um, kind of hits us in the moment. I, as Brian said, Eighth Grade was one of the standout films for us this year, and there's so much um, to draw upon, you know, movies like that, and both in, in life and, and towards movies that we want to make in the future. So. Well, guys, thanks so much, and, and congrats not only on kids, but also on other babies, these projects coming to life. <laughs> Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, can't wait to see what, what you guys do with Stephen cool. King and all these projects. Yes. Sounds like a lot of fun. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much.